Assalamu alaikum. Welcome viewers on Zoom, Facebook, YouTube to the virtual peace symposium organized by the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community. This event, as we know, normally the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is at the forefront of organizing such events and bringing people to the mocks, people from various uh, communities, backgrounds to the mocks, to make to bring them together for us to what celebrate things which are common among us and to instill the discipline that we all fight for in this world. We live in the world today when you turn on the TV, you read the magazines, the news, and you see there's a bit of a turmoil which is happening all around the world. The Amodia Muslim community has this in mind that we want to help instill peace and justice in the world. And this is why we organize such events. We do such events always at our mocks, but due to the COVID, due to the coronavirus, unfortunately, we cannot meet in the mocks as such because we still want to ensure that we do what, what pleases our heart. We have adopted this virtual system to ensure that the good work that we are doing continue to what, to progress. Just to let everyone know, this is your event. It's a peace symposium. And the theme is the man who championed human rights. As such, those on Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and then even Instagram, find a chance to send your questions in the comments column. And then when it gets to the Q&A session, we'll be able to answer those questions if time permits. We now, as Muslims, always start our program with a recitation from the Holy Quran. And with this, I call on our youth leader of Glasgow, Sajil Sajad, to do that recitation for us. <laughs> Translation of Chapter 7, 
verses 158 to 159 of the Holy Quran are as follows. I seek refuge in Allah from Satan the accursed. In the name of Allah, the gracious, ever merciful. Those who follow the messenger, the prophet, the immaculate one, whom they find mentioned in the Torah and the gospel, which are with them, he enjoins on them good and forbids them evil and makes lawful for them the good things and forbids them the bad and removes from them their burden and the shackles that warp upon them. So those who shall believe in him and honor and support him and help him and follow the light that has been sent down with him, these shall prosper. Say, O mankind, truly I am a messenger to you, all from Allah to whom belongs the kingdom of the heavens and the earth. There is no God but he, he gives life and he causes death. So believe in Allah and his messenger, the prophet, the immaculate one, who believes in Allah and his words and follow him that you may be rightly guided. Follow the prophet Muhammad Mustafa, may the peace and mercy of the almighty Allah be upon him and you will be rightly guided. Thank you very much, our brother. Sajil Sajjad, uh, the youth leader of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in Glasgow for that beautiful recitation and that English translation. We now move on to our next uh, um, on the agenda, which is uh, a video introduction to the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. This is a short video that will give you some glimpse of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Um, and who we are. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community is a dynamic, fast-growing international revival movement within Islam. Founded in 1889, the community spans more than 195 countries, with membership exceeding tens of millions. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community is the only Muslim community to believe that the long-awaited promised Messiah has arrived in the person of Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian, India. The promised Messiah claimed to be the metaphorical second coming of Jesus of Nazareth, and the divine guide whose advent was foretold by the holy prophet of Islam, Muhammad, peace be upon him. The community believes that Allah has sent the promised Messiah to end religious wars, condemn bloodshed, and to reinstitute morality, justice and peace for mankind. The advent of the promised Messiah has brought an unprecedented era of Islamic revival. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community is the leading Islamic organization that categorically rejects any form of terrorism. Over a century ago, the promised Messiah emphatically declared that the doctrine of violent jihad goes against the teachings of the Holy Quran and the practice of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. The promised Messiah's advent has ushered in a new era of dialogue, tolerance and prayer. The promised Messiah penned over 80 books and thousands of articles, delivering countless lectures, engaging in public debate and prayer duels in an intellectual, spiritual campaign to defend the true honour of Islam. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community is the foremost Islamic organisation with a central spiritual leader. Over a century ago, the Promised Messiah reminded his followers of Allah's promise to safeguard the message of Islam through Khilafat, the spiritual institution of successorship to prophethood. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community believes that only the spiritual successorship can uphold the true values of Islam and unite humanity. Five spiritual leaders have succeeded the Promised Messiah since his passing in 1908. The fifth head of the community his Holiness, Hazrat Mizam Surur Ahmad, resides in the United Kingdom. Under the leadership of its spiritual successors, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has built over 15,000 mosques, over 500 schools, and more than 30 hospitals. It has translated the Holy Quran to over 60 languages. The community propagates the peaceful true teachings of Islam through a 24-hour broadcast channel, MTA, through the community's website, alislam.org, and print, 
Islam International Publications. The community has been at the forefront of disaster response worldwide through an independent charity, Humanity First. We now move on to our next uh, on the agenda, which is uh, our first presentation for tonight. And that is uh, our respected uh, Imam of the Glasgow Mosque, Mr. Rawuddin Arif Khan. Rawuddin Arif Khan is, uh, is a young uh, missionary who, who graduated from the Ahmadiyya Seminary and Institute in the United Kingdom uh, about five years ago and served in London uh, as a missionary of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in East London. And it's now been transferred to Scotland in Glasgow as the, the head of the uh, Glasgow Mosque, the Imam, and then also the Scotland uh, youth leader of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, uh, Scotland. So with this, I invite, I have the singular honor to invite our new Imam of the Glasgow Mosque, Mr. Rawuddin Arif Khan to give his presentation. Jazakallah sanaza. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all. I have been given the opportunity to talk about the relation between Islam and other faiths. The Holy Quran says at the beginning of the very first chapter, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise belongs to Allah, Lord of all the worlds. Which means that God is not only the God of Muslims, but also of all other religions, faiths, and of all mankind. Furthermore, Allah Almighty says, Surely the believers and the Jews and the Christians and the Sabians, whichever party from among these truly believe in Allah and the last day and does good deeds, shall have their reward with their Lord, and no fear shall come upon them, nor shall they grieve. This verse of chapter 2, verse 63, clearly says that no matter which party you belong to, if you truly believe in God and the last day and do good deeds, you will surely be rewarded from your Lord. Islam is a religion which stands for loyalty, freedom, equality, respect, and peace. This was shown to us by the noble character of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. If you look at the life and character of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it is without a shadow of doubt that at every moment of his life, the Prophet of Islam manifested immense love and respect for all people. His pure and noble heart was filled with compassion, and at all times he sought the betterment of mankind and strived to alleviate the suffering of others. He taught his followers to respect and value all humanity. For example, on one occasion, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was sitting down, but immediately stood up as a mark of respect when he observed a funeral procession pass by. Upon this, one of his companions mentioned that the deceased was a Jewish person and not a Muslim. Hearing this, the Prophet of Islam asked, was he not a human? This reflected the love in his heart for all of humanity. It also manifests how he guided his followers towards treating the people of all religions and beliefs with compassion and being sensitive and respectful to their feelings and needs. Furthermore, many people question whether Islam advocates free freedom of religion. 
So to answer this, let me present another incident from the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Once a delegation of Christians from the Arab city of Najran came to meet the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in Medina. After some time, the Christian became restless. And so the Holy Prophet وسلم, inquired if something was wrong. In response, the Christians informed him that it was time for their worship, but they did not have an appropriate place to perform their prayers or rituals. Upon this, the Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, invited the Christians to worship in his own mosque in Medina, according to their own traditions and ways. Through this munificent and magnanimous gesture, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, set an everlasting example of tolerance, freedom of religion, and freedom of worship for all mankind. Nevertheless, some people question why wars and battles were fought by the early Muslims. So let it be clear that wherever Islam permitted the use of force, it was never to conquer lands or to compel people to accept Islam. Rather, where the Holy Quran authorized the early Muslims to utilize a degree of force, it clearly stipulated that permission was granted in order to establish peace and security and to ensure the true freedom of religion and freedom of belief prevailed. It explained that the use of force was not given to save Islam, but was given in order to protect the rights of all people and religions and to guarantee the rights of all communities to believe as they pleased. Consequently, in chapter 22, verse 41 of the Holy Quran, where permission was first granted to Muslims to engage in a defensive war, it clarified that the opponents of Islam were not waging war against the Muslims for any personal, national or political reasons. Rather, they were motivated by the hatred of religion itself. The verse warned that if the Muslims did not take firm steps to stop the cruelties and injustices, it would lead to the end of all religions and freedom of belief would cease to exist. The verse categorically says that churches, synagogues, temples, and mosques, or any other places of worship would not be safe if they were permitted to wage war or if their attacks were not retaliated. Thus, rather than imposing restrictions or curtailing freedoms, the truth is that the world's first and foremost universal charter of religious freedom was the Holy Quran itself. Moreover, as Islam has enshrined freedom of belief as a basic human right, it naturally follows that true mosques are symbols of religious freedom and shining beacons of love, mutual respect and compassion. Indeed, the Holy Quran has repeatedly instructed Muslims to fulfill the rights of their neighbors and to treat them with the utmost love and affection, irrespective of race or religion. I should clarify that our neighbors are not only those who live close to the mosque or close to the homes of Ahmadi Muslims, rather the circle of neighbors, according to the Holy Quran, spreads much further afield and includes a person's colleagues, subordinates, travel companions, and many other people beside. In essence, all the people of this city are our neighbors, and it is our religious obligation to treat them with love, kindness, and generosity. Then the Holy Quran says, you are the best people raised for the good of mankind. You enjoin what is good and forbid evil. This is a major claim made by the Holy Quran that obviously means that the deeds done by you should be such as benefit the people. Do not simply be beneficial to yourself, but enjoin others to do what is good and forbid evil. Tell others that it is only the good that lasts forever. Therefore, attend to the, to the due rights of each other. The Holy Quran does not say that you are raised for the good of Muslims, but says for the good of mankind, the beliefs 
of the one who believes in God will be real only when he enjoins good, spreads good, and forbids evil. So to create an atmosphere of love and peace in international relations, the Holy Quran exhorts us, O ye who believe, let not one people deride another people, who may be better than they, nor let women deride other women who may be better than they. This is from chapter 49, verse 12. So that is the basic principle in promoting a relationship between different people and faith. Do not utter anything that is hurtful to others, even in a lighter vein, not to speak of using all the media to erect walls of hatred. I give you one example to illustrate how the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, respected the sentiments of others. Once a Jewish person came to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and complained that Hazrat Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, who was the first, later on the first caliph uh, of Islam, had hurt his feelings. Now see, who was he complaining against? It was against one who was the most dear friend and companion of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and for whom he had very special sentiments. But when the Jewish person complained, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, kept in view the Quranic injunction let not a people's enmity incite you to act otherwise than with justice. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, asked the Jewish person how Abu Bakr had hurt him. The Jewish person replied that Abu Bakr had said, I swear by Muhammad, the messenger of Allah, whom God has exalted above Moses, peace be upon him. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, called for Abu Bakr and inquired, what the matter was. He stated that the Jewish person had started it by saying that he swore by Moses, peace be upon him, whom God has exalted above the whole world. Upon this, I responded by saying that Muhammad, the messenger of Allah, was made superior. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, told Abu Bakr that he should not have said so and that he should be mindful of the sentiments of others. He said, do not exalt me above Moses, peace be upon him. Despite the fact that God had given him the title of the seal of the prophets, as he was the last of the law bearing prophets and the Sharia had been perfected in the Holy Quran. And it was an integral part of the beliefs of Muslims. So out of respect for the sentiments of the Jewish person, he told Abu Bakr not to declare as such because that had hurt the Jewish person. This incident took place when the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, was the ruler of Medina and had full power of serenity over it. That is the measure of respect we must show for the sentiments of others if we wish to maintain peace in society. An important point that I would like to make in regards to religious tolerance is that a Muslim can never defame nor show disrespect to any prophet because he believes in all prophets. In particular, an Ahmadi Muslim believes in prophets more than an ordinary Muslim does because in addition to believing in all prophets up to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who was the prophet of Islam, he believes in the promised Messiah and reformer of the age, peace be upon him, who was to gather all faiths and establish peace love and affection in the world and has done so. The history of more than a hundred years of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community bears testimony to the fact that we are truly markers and keepers of peace. The founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian, peace be upon him, once said, and I would like to end my speech with this quote, if a person sees that his Hindu's, Hindu neighbor's house is set on fire and he himself does not get up to extinguish that fire, then I say tr to you truly that he is not of me. If a man from among my followers sees that someone is killing a Christian person and he does not offer help to rescue him, then I tell you truly that he is not of us.
This clearly shows the true teachings of Islam, which are love for all, hatred for none. And that is also the motto of our Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Thank you. Jazakumullah Asan Hazza wa akhirul da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Thank you very much, our dear respected Imam Rawauddin Arif Khan of the Glasgow Mosque for that uh, beautiful presentation. We now move on to our uh, guest speakers uh, for today. Uh, and the first speaker is no other person than our own dear friend, Reverend Peter Gill, Minister of uh, Minister for the Church of Scotland. Peter is Minister for the Church of Scotland and he is Scotland's first Pakistani Church of Scotland minister to be ordained in uh, Scotland. He happens to be a co-founder and a president of the Interfaith Group in Renfrew in Scotland. And I have the singular honor to invite Peter Gill to address us. Thank you very much, Ahmad. This indeed, can you hear me all? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, okay. So indeed my joy and privilege to come and listen to you and also share my thoughts on that as well. Um, it's, it's amazing what uh, the early Islam, you were talking about how tolerant they, they were to the Christian community, Jewish community, and also the examples you give um, in India uh, about Hindu people. Uh, so that, that's very, very uh, wonderful examples. And uh, I I'm really afraid that it's not has been highlighted and uh, all over the particularly the country which came in the name of Islam because um, there were only two countries in the world they came in the name of a religion the first one also my beloved country I mean my, my homeland Pakistan in 1947 and then Israel came into existence in 1948 afterwards so I thought that, you know, that should be the kind of uh, laboratory, uh, you know, because if you have a medicine and you think that is going to heal the world and then you have experiment somewhere and, you know, if someone came in the name, particularly name of Islam and his name is Pak, which means holy and land, holy land. And uh, so that would be a wonderful example for the world if real Islam has been introduced there and that would become a healing bomb for the nation, bringing the human rights all over the world, especially the Muslim world to become an example. But unfortunately, as I think more than 70 years has, uh, has not been implemented. It has been failed in uh, providing human rights um, and also, I'm um, really sorry to say, the people have been given impunity to uh, kill people in the name of religion, people of other faith, to rob, to rape, and cheat in the name of religion. And when they go for even to get FIR, which is the first information report, that had been denied. And uh, there are so many examples and experience, and I don't want to take most of your time to going into de details. Quite recently, there has been an incident also in Gortki, which is in the area. The, Jew and the Hindu girls have been forced into marriage, and there has not been notice taken by the government. So was Christian girls raped, and also forced marriages happened there many times. Quite recently, I got a report from Mr. Joseph. He bought, purchased a property, a land in Peshawar area, and uh, he was the only Christian who were able to bought that piece of land there, but the rest were all other majority community. And uh, there's two or three family members were shot, and Joseph himself was shot because this they could not accept having a, a Christian buying a piece of land or property in that particular area. When the time comes 
came to build churches, there's always uh, hindrance and difficulties, particularly in Islamabad area, when the Church of Pakistan was about to be built and they were going to purchase the land. And that was really, really, really hard and difficult. So what my thought is that that experience where it should be some a land which was kind of laboratory, it should be experimental place to apply the early Islamic laws and constitution of Sharia uh, has not been able to enforce. I mean, I'm not afraid of Sharia if they're particularly it uh, applied, you know, to part in, a, in a proper way, but like blasphemy law and all that, that I really f don't, don't see a place because Prophet himself, the Prophet of Islam, forgave the lady who all every day pour garbage on him, as I heard and learned that. And one day she did not do that. And he was very, very concerned about that. And he went to ask if she was okay and she was ill. And uh, he looked after her. Uh, what a lovely example. If the blasphemy law should have been enforced then and there, she was the first who insulted the prophet's prophet. And why she has not been punished? She was forgiven. She was looked after. And that's the way to spread peace, the true faith of Islam, which unfortunately has not been enforced. And coming from a Christian background, I personally have some persecution example experience as well. My own property was taken away and still for the last 13 years I'm struggling, have not been able to manage to put FIR report. My brother-in-law in my absence went and every time he was refused. And it's really the way the discrimination against Christians, Muslims, and particularly to Ahmadiyya community, it's really humiliating and up you know, upheaval, and I really feel very sad that that Islam, the original Islam, has not been implemented and enforced. So the problem is with the you know human right violation, implementation, and reinforcement, and awareness of uh, human rights. So many people, I mean, don't have the human rights. You know, people don't have rights to live if they are not Muslim. They're treated badly. Even to go for a job, I have equal education, but the person who is a majority community will get a job. And then if you are not practicing that kind of, you know, faith or that particular uh, sometimes sect, then you, you will not be getting the job. And the, the president, uh, the prime minister still keeps saying, you know, he's, he's going to enforce Islamic law of Sharia and make a Medina state, you know, so that is, uh, far beyond his vision, which he trying to, and it's not happening, it's ha haven't never happened so far. So I don't know what is the answer, how to get it done, but uh, I'm glad you're giving that kind of conferences and awareness and people opportunity to talk and share your own kind of ideas and your thoughts, which seems more kind of uh, original Islamic views and thoughts that as I understand. And um, so wish you all the best. And my prayer is that we can promote more love, unity and harmony among the communities and different parts of the world through interfaith, through interaction or whatever we can do, we do our best. And so my thoughts and prayers are always with you. Whenever you need uh, me to speak or say something or invite, I'll be more than happy. Come and join you guys. God bless you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening together. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, Reverend Peter Gill. I mean, I'm very, 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 very close. That's why I tend to call him Peter. But then I believe he, he, he doesn't mind that one at all. Reverend Peter okay. Gill, thank you very much for that wonderful. We are friend. It's okay. You can call me Peter. I don't mind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. One of the one of the best friend. He was with us Interfaith International, but unfortunately <laughs> left, and we're missing you there. Your presence was really every morning. We receive a verse from or some very nice, you know, thought for the day, and people are missing that and missing you as well. I hope sometime you come back, and you. your doors are always open for you, brother. 
God Thank bless. you very much. And then our prayers and thoughts are definitely with you and obviously people in Pakistan, uh, the minorities in Pakistan for those uh, unfortunate uh, circumstances that they face there. I now want to acknowledge some of the uh, dignitaries who have joined us today. Uh, I know we're still waiting on some of them to join. Uh, we're still waiting. Yes, definitely. We don't have some of them here with us, but I will just acknowledge two of them who are here with us. And that is uh, Councillor Aileen uh, McCartin, uh, MBE, uh, who's a Scottish Liberal Democrat Councillor for Paisley South Ward. And then we also have uh, our brother, uh, Ronald Bala, who is the General Secretary of the Union of Liberians Organizations in the United Kingdom. Thank you very much for taking time to join us. And then hopefully we wish to see you more in our events. As we know, um, if it had not been COVID, we would all be probably be at the mosque in uh, our Bay to Rahman Mosque in Glasgow, West End. But due to this COVID, we are here virtually. So we thought it would be nice for those of you who have not had a chance to visit the mosque, to give you a virtual tour of the mosque and how the mosque is actually coping with this uh, COVID situation. So with this, we have a virtual tour for our viewers. Welcome to the virtual tour of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community Mosque in Glasgow. Located in the York Hill area in the west end of the city, this beautiful building was built in 1904 as a Masonic Lodge by the Freemasons. Eighty years later, it was purchased by the community in 1984 and it was converted into a mosque and inaugurated by the fourth caliph of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, Hazrat Mirza Tahir Ahmed. May Allah have mercy on him. He named the mosque Beto Rahman Mosque, House of the Gracious. Over the years, many events have taken place such as peace symposia, charity fundraising, and open days, to name a few. The mosque has also been blessed with two visits from the fifth caliph and the current head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. People from all around the world have come to visit this mosque. We also had the pleasure of hosting our Right Honourable First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. Due to the current pandemic, Special measures, according to government guidelines, are in place to ensure the safety of people praying in the mosque. The number of people worshipping in the mosque is restricted, temperature checks are taken, and the special register is kept of each visitor. Members are required to wear face masks and bring their own prayer mats. Before every prayer, it is obligatory to perform ablution as it is a requirement to be clean and pure in order to worship Allah Almighty. The mosque has a large prayer area for men as well as for women. Both are separate from each other. Shoes are not allowed in the prayer area of the mosque to keep it clean and tidy. The prayer area is kept plain and simple with no pictures or paintings. There are a few Arabic inscriptions on the wall that say, Surely in the remembrance of Allah, hearts find comfort. Worshippers cover their head and refrain from eating or drinking in the mosque area used for prayers. There are five prayers performed at the mosque daily. Before each prayer, the adhan, the call to prayer, is given in a beautiful and melodious way. The prayer starts by raising both hands and saying Allahu Akbar. Allah is the greatest. The prayer is led by the Imam who stands at the front in a special area called the Mihrab. Everyone else stands in rows behind the Imam facing the same direction. All Muslims around the world pray by facing towards the Holy Kaaba in Mecca which is a symbol of unity. There are no special places reserved at the mosque. The worshippers stand shoulder to shoulder, rich or poor, short or tall, irrespective of background, colour or race. However, because of COVID-19, 
a two meter distance between each worshipper is mandatory at all times. Prayer in congregation is emphasized in Islam. According to a saying of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, prayer in congregation holds 27 times more blessings than prayer offered alone. He has also said that prayer in the mosque is only required when it is safe to do so. Friday is a special day for all Muslims and is called Juma. A sermon is delivered by the Imam and a prayer is offered instead of the midday prayer. After the prayer, members leave the mosque quietly from a different door, keeping social distance to other members in mind. Apart from the praying areas, the mosque also has a kitchen to prepare meals, an extensive library accessible to all visitors, and various offices and meeting rooms are also part of the facility where classes, lectures and meetings are held in normal circumstances. Normally this event would take place in our multi-purpose hall. During this current pandemic, members are not using these facilities. We hope you have enjoyed the introduction to the mosque. If you would like more information about the Ahmadiyya Muslim community and our mosque, please contact our local missionary, Imam Arif Khan, using the contact details on screen. We hope you have enjoyed the virtual tour. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, beautiful uh, mock tour. And I believe the viewers would have enjoyed and see what is happening in mocks in this COVID period. As such, if you want to have a virtual tour or meet the Imam, the new Imam, our young uh, Imam, feel free to contact him on the, the various contact which has been given. And then he will be able to take you on a virtual tour or answer some of your queries that you want to have answered. We seem to be reaching the climax of the event today, and that is the keynote speech. We have our keynote speaker, Mr. Muhammad Ibrahim Eklov, who is the director of the Outreach and Public Relations Department of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community, United Kingdom, and a lecturer in Arabic at the Ahmadiyya International Islamic Seminary and Educational Institute in the United Kingdom. He's also in charge of the international translation desk for Arabic and English, and then the research of and the research office within the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. He is of an Arab descent and studied economics, Arabic and Islamic studies at the University of Leiden in Holland and in the University of Leuven in Belgium. I believe anyone from Holland and uh, Belgium probably may not have may, may have noticed I've not pronounced it well, please do pardon me. Um, he is a regular writer translator and a presenter on Islam and has addressed many UK and international gatherings. And I now have the singular honor to invite our keynote speaker, Mr. Muhammad Ibrahim Iklav, to give his keynote speech. Mr. Ibrahim Iklav. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la. وأشهد أن محمد أن عبده ورسوله أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما Allah and his angels send their blessings on the Prophet O ye who believe you also should invoke blessings on him and salute him with a salutation of peace all distinguished guests, Salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for introducing me and for giving me the opportunity 
to address the audience. Somehow, I think uh, during, during your introduction, I saw someone, I think from the Ahmadiyya, from the PAMA, from the Pan-African uh, Association, and he had a status on his written. There was something very interesting written, and he wrote, and he has a status, and this is a quote from the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, the founder of the community. It says, my dear child, the hell of which the Holy Quran speaks is none other than this greed for the world. Since in the end, one must bid farewell to this world and must sooner or later, later take this trip. Why should then a wise man tie his heart to a garden whose flowers are a prey to the autumn ones? If we take this point into consideration, we will solve all the issues in the world. In today's world, we see that certain issues are constantly being highlighted and labeled as the most significant problems of our time. For example, some people are emphasizing the threat of global war warming, the climate change. Then there are others who are extremely concerned about the various conflicts and the increasingly volatile state of the world. If we analyze the world situation objectively, we will realize that the world peace and security is indeed the most critical issue of our time. Unquestionably, with each day that pass, the world is becoming unstable and dangerous. And there are a number of potential causes for this. Then, from the religious point of view, then there are people who ask the following question. Does modern humanity really need religion? Has the era of religious faith truly passed with the ascension of humankind to the heights of empirical knowledge? Does the endless horizon of empirical research leave any room for religion? Is religion a thing of superstition, superstition and religious research a futile activity? The Ahmadiyya community seeks to present answers to these issues in light of the teachings of Islam. Indeed, this is the age of man. Man starts to be conscious of his own position in this universe and demands that his personality and dignity shall be accorded due recognition and respect. He starts to take note of that which his fellow beings, society and the state owe to him and of that which in turn he owes to them. This consciousness needs to be aroused where it may still be lacking and to be sharpened where it has been awakened. Then if we take this again into consideration, how is it that after having experienced the devastating experience of two world wars and being the shadow of a nuclear holocaust, despite all the efforts that have so far been put forth to the contrary, man continues to be the victim of racism, discrimination, intolerance, and cruelty at the hands of his fellow man. For example, I give you a beautiful example of what happened now. The world is in shock from the barbaric murder of the French teacher, Samuel Paty. Our message from the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, UK, to every individual or group that seeks to cause harm or create disorder in society is to remember that mankind is one human family and it should resolve its differences through peaceful means. God's religion should never be misused to justify murder. The Quran says that if you kill one innocent person, it's like as if you killed all mankind. The Quran says that whosoever kills a person, it shall be as if he had, as if he had killed all mankind. And the one who gives life to one, it shall be as if he had given life to all mankind. That is, thus, what the attacker has done in France is completely contrary to the Islamic teachings. Let's be clear about it. It is a grievous and a great sin 
We condemn this in the strongest term. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community considers this to be an outrageous and evil attack, attack that can never be justified in any way or under any circumstances. The teachings of the Quran, the teachings of the Holy Prophet Muhammad are of peace and love for humanity. Throughout his life, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, condemned all forms of warfare, aggression and injustice. Therefore, we offer our deepest condolences to the family of Samuel Petit. The teacher himself was blameless as he was acting within the law, following the curriculum, and this makes the crime even more despicable. The teacher educating his, educating his students regarding expression of and free, uh, regarding free speech and other matters in conformity with the school's curriculum and guidelines is not wrong, far less a crime, far less one deserving to be killed at the hands of such a monster. However, we should also say, we completely oppose as Muslims, the showing of cartoons, mocking the Holy Prophet Muhammad or any other figure of religious importance or for that matter, whether Moses or Jesus, whether Muhammad or D David or Abraham or Krishna or Buddha, anyone, the Prophet Messiah in his book, Message of Peace states the following, the Quran is that revered book which laid the foundation of peace between nations and acknowledged the truth of all prophets belong to all the different nations. He said, oh my dear countrymen, I have not expressed this view to offend you or to hurt your sensibilities in any way, but I do desire to submit in all sincerity, that those who have made it their second nature to abuse, to mock at, to vilify the prophets of other faiths and consider this unjustified behavior to be part of their doctrine or faith, commit an act of unwarranted interference in other affairs. They not only sin against God, but they are also guilty of sowing the seed of discord and enmity among mankind. Now answer me, he says with hand on his heart. If someone abuses another's father or accuses another's mother of unchaste conduct, will this not be tantamount to assailing the honor of his father himself? In that if anyone retaliates with similar abuses, will it be appropriate to say that in reality the blame of abusing lies with the person who initiated it. In this case, we mean insulting and mocking as a retaliation. Yet God teaches the Muslims to abstain from insulting even the idols and admonishes, admonishes them instead to adopt a course of gentle persuasion. Lest they, the idolaters, should be provoked, in turn, abuse Allah. What manner of people are they who revile? We believe as Muslims and we consider, I can tell you for all, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu peace be upon him, dearer than our own fathers and our mothers. Our fathers and mothers are biological fathers who in the footsteps of the Holy Prophet give us the right upbringing, moral and spiritual training. We love him and speak with disrespect to him, it hurts us, it hurts our sentiments. But we can never retaliate, never. Islam says in such cases, you have to show the beauty of Islam and the beauty of the Holy Prophet. If free speech is so prized in this society, is it then okay to make anti-Semitic statements? Again, I want to mention to everyone, for example, everyone knows, for example, be it Arabs themselves, I'm of Arab origin, and I'm also of Semitic race. Please, we have to bear in mind, I, as an Arab, I'm also of Semitic race. The Jewish and the Arabs are just brothers. They are cousins of each other. If free speech is so prized, is it okay to make anti-Semitic statements? No. 
Is it okay to use racist language? Okay, of course not. The cartoon seeks to lay the blame of terrorism, as we see sometimes at religion. And God, this is not just. We say, as Ahmadi, Muslims, anyone who perpetrates any form of extremism or terrorism against this acts in reality against the teachings of all religions, not only against Islam. The violence or extremism is the fault of the individual, it's not the religion of God. There is a fine line. The Quran makes a prophecy that at the end of times, there were three kinds of people. One kind of people, if I will apply that principle towards our society, then is there is the one kind of people who completely oppose mocking people's beliefs. They are complete against freedom of speech and they support murder, terrorism, and the killing of innocents. That is one category of people. Then we have a second category of people who say there should be an absolute freedom of speech to that extent that there is no problem we can offend and hurt others' feelings. There is also no problem with it. Then, I can tell you, Islam says, like any other religion, whether Christianity or Judaism, it emphasizes the role of balanced freedom in the spirit of give and take. The concept of absolute freedom is hollow, weird, and unreal in the context of a society. Sometimes the concept of freedom is so misconceived and so misapplied that the beauty of cherished principle of freedom of speech gets transformed into the ugliness of freedom to abuse, insult, and to blaspheme. Freedom of speech and expression, again, are extremely important. They are vital. They are also vital religiously, for example, to spread the message of, to, uh, the message of peace, whether through Christianity or Islam or any other religion as well to restore the dignity of man. No religion is in reality worthy of any consideration unless it addresses itself to the restoration and protection of human dignity. I tell you, the Holy Prophet Muhammad said, killing, you see, you know, killing of the, you, the, the sacredness of the holiness, the value of a human being, is so valuable and so precious and so sacred. You know, even if you go to break the Kaaba, which is in Mecca, brick by brick, you destroyed it completely. The Holy Prophet said, the sacredness of human being is more important. Look to the heaven, the Mecca, which is such an important, the Kaaba there. And he says the human being, the life of a human being is more important than sacred because that's just a building or it is a symbol, but still human life is more sacred. Islam discourages indecent behavior and indecent talk or hurting the sense sensitivity of others. Islam does not allow any Muslim to insult Moses as the missionary already mentioned before me. Islam does not allow any Muslim to put cartoons and attack the Jewish people. Islam does not allow to put on cartoons Jesus, because if we do that, we will hurt the feelings of our Christian brothers. We, the Quran says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ We, Muhammad, have not sent thee, but as a mercy for all people. The Ahmadiyya community is recognized far and wide for its selfless commitment for serving others. We run schools, universities, hospitals, which provide education and healthcare in the most remote, remote parts of the world for those who are in need, irrespective of their color, religion, or background. We seek to wipe away the tears, as our caliph said, we seek to wipe away the tears of those who are in pain. We seek to remove their grief, desperation, and heart, and other problems. We seek to fulfill their needs. We want them to stand on their feet. Wherever in the world our mosques are built, or wherever the Ahmadiyya community established, 
the local people soon come to realize that we do not practice, we do not disseminate, accept peace, harmony, and tolerance. Yes, we believe in jihad. There is no one who believes in the true concept of jihad as us, but we believe that this era, the true jihad, is not the jihad of the sword. This is the jihad of self-struggle towards betterment. It is the jihad of de developing goodness and righteousness within ourselves. It is the jihad to spread peace and justice over the world. How can we say after that that Islam is a religion that promotes aggression and radicalism? How can we say that Islam spreads this, or spreads this order and in, in the society? How can we claim that Islam seeks to violate the honor of women? God the Almighty revealed to the Holy Prophet, I was a treasure unknown. Then I desired to be known. So I created a creation to which I made myself known. Then they know me. We believe that everyone strives for himself. But prophets like Jesus, peace be upon him, Moses, Muhammad, all strive for others. We believe that people sleep. The prophets and the caliph stay awake on their behalf. We believe people laugh and the prophets weep for them. They willingly bear hardship for the deliverance of mankind. Once Hazrat Aisha, the Holy Prophet's wife, said that the character of Muhammad was the Holy Quran. She meant that the Prophet reflected in his own person the highest degree of excellences. So that the Quran says, you have in Muhammad the messenger, an excellent example for him who fears Allah in the last day. The Holy Prophet, Islam is so clear, the spirit of brotherhood is emphasized at every turn in Islam. It is the practical expression of the truth that all men are creatures and servants of the same beneficent creator. The Holy Prophet said, and these two mankind, you are all brothers, one to one another. So let no one trans transgress against another, nor leave any one to endure transgression unaided. Remember that you occupies himself in assisting his brother will find God coming to his own assistance. And he who strives to relieve his brother of anxiety will find himself shielded against anxiety by God on the day of judgment. And he who overlooks his brother's fault will find his own faults overlooked by God. He said, none of you can be a believer. You can never be good believer unless he should desire for his brother what he desires for himself. He said, help your brother whether he's an oppressor or an oppressed. The people ask him, how can we help an oppressor? He said, stop him from continuing in his course of oppression. My, our brother, the missionary, the new established missionary in Glasgow, he sp spoke about the Medina Charter. And it has been mentioned that Medina whether Muhammad was a spiritual as political leader, was a multi-religious and multi-ethnicity was there in the city. Remember Medina was inhabited by 4,000, just for you to remember, 4,500 Jews and 4,000 non-Muslim Arabs and 1,500 Muslims. It was a pluralistic society with diversity and multi-ethnicity. I give you a beautiful example for people who are unaware of it, and it still exists, the agreement, that covenant, the covenant which the Holy Prophet himself made with the monks of St. Catherine's Monastery. It was written in 624 as a covenant from the Holy Prophet Muhammad of Islam. I want, please, for those Christians and for those people are non-Muslims to listen to this, to this point, extremely important. The Holy Prophet writes, says, better to say, this is a message from Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, as a covenant to those who adopt Christianity. Near and far, we are with them. I, the servants, the helpers, and my followers, 
defend Christians, these monks, because Christians are my citizens. And by God, I hold against anything that displeases them. No compulsion is to be on them. Neither there are there judges to be removed from their jobs, nor their monks from their monasteries. No one is to destroy a house of their religion, to damage it, or to carry anything from it to the Muslim houses. The churches should be respected. They are neither to be prevented from repairing them, nor the sacredness of their covenant. N then he says, no one is to force them to travel. No one is for forcing them to fight. The Muslims should fight for them. If a female Christian is married to a Muslim, it is not to take place without her approval. She is not to be prevented from visiting her church to pray. The, the Holy Prophet was so clear. Then the Holy Quran states, there is no superiority of others. It says in Arabic, Ya ayyuhannas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha, wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu, inna kramakum indallahi atqakum, inna allaha alimun khabir. O mankind, we created you from a male and a female. We have made you into tribes and sub-tribes for the sake of easy recognition. The most honorable among you in the sight of God is the one who's the most righteous among you. Remember, Allah is always, is all knowing, is all aware. Then the Quran says, all praise belongs to Allah. That is the first chapter starts, all praise belongs to Allah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of the worlds. The Muslims, the God who Muslims worship is the one God who sustains and nourishes everything and everyone without distinction. He fulfills all of their needs. He's the God of Christians. He's the God of the Jews, the God of the Hindus. And indeed, he even give nourishments to anyone, whether he believes or does not believe. Mankind was one community. And the duty of a prophet is to unite them to remove their differences caused by mischievous people. By acknowledging the unity of creator, we are bound to confess the unity of all creation. How can one profess love for God, but hate for some of his creation? Islam promotes peace and absolute unity, but this can never be established except by adhering to the absolute principle of justice. Peace and unity can only be achieved through absolute justice. Finally, I want to emphasize on two things. Before the Holy Prophet's death, in his farewell pilgrimage, he delivered in such an address, which is delivered to the large, last, largest, multifaceted gathering before his death. He said, praise be to God, we glorify him, we thank him, we expect help from him. We ask to be forgiven by him and with repentance, O oh people, lend me an attentive ear, for I not know whether after this year I shall be among you. Then he said, O oh servants of God, I advise you to take refuge in God, hold fast to his commandments, your blood, your lives, your right to live, your property, your decency and dignity and honor, your bodily integrity are worthy of respect and protection and are inviolable until the day you meet your Lord. Hear me so that you may continue to live peacefully with dignity and honor. Do not commit injustice. Do not oppress. Do not make force a tool for oppression and torture. Do not bow for oppression. Do not accept injustice. Then he said, Allah be my witness. O people, do you know which month, which day, and which country you are in? Then he said, I caution you. Each person is responsible only for the crimes he has committed. A father will be accountable for the deeds of his, will not be accountable for the deeds of his son, nor the son for the father. Then he says, treat your woman 
well and be kind to them. They are your friends, your partners. Shall I explain you what a Muslim is? And now this is his own words. A person from whose tongue and hand all others are safe. Shall I tell you what a believer is? A person, people are sure, will not harm their property and their lives. Shall I tell you what a migrant is? A person who has abandoned, abandoned committing evil and sin. Shall I tell you what a mujahid is, the one who really performs jihad? A person struggling against his ego on the road of obedience to God. O oh man, your God is one and your ancestor is one. An Arab possesses no superiority over a non-Arab, nor does an Arab, non-Arab over an Arab. A white man is not superior to a black, nor a black to a white, but only to the extent to which he discharges his duty to God and man. The most honorable among you is the one who's the most righteous among you. O people, avoid extremism in religion, for certain it made those before you perish. These are the words of the Holy Prophet. And finally, I want to say one thing because of what happened in America. In regard to slavery, people are asking, what does Islam say about slavery? We categorically prohibit all channels of, ens of enslaving people. The Holy Prophet, I just read something out, two quotes. Abu Dar, the companion of the Holy Prophet, narrates, the Holy Prophet would state, your slaves are your brothers. If an individual has a slave under his control and he wants to free them all and he freed them all, then he should feed him what he eats himself. He should clothe him what he himself wears. Do not burden your slaves with a task that is beyond their capacity. On one occasion, the fourth caliph, Hazrat Ali, came to his shop. At the time, he was accompanied by one of his slaves. Ali purchased two thin shirts and sent to, said to his slave, select the shirt you desire from among these two. Hence, the sla slave chose a shirt and the fourth caliph, Hazrat Ali, was the one which was left behind. The last, Abu Mas'ud, he was one of the companions of the Prophet, he relates that on one occasion, due to some reason, I hit my slave. At that time, I heard the voice of a person from behind me saying, look here, O Abu Mas'ud, what are you doing? But in my anger, I could not recognize the voice and I continued to beat the slave. During this time, the voice began to move closer. When I turned around, I found the Holy Prophet Muhammad approaching me. He repeated the words, look here, O Mas'ud, what are you doing? When I saw Muhammad, my staff fell from my hands. The Holy Prophet looked angrily to me and said, O Abu Mas'ud, there is a God above you who possesses more power with respect to you than you possess over the slave. I submitted, O oh, Muhammad, I free the slave for the sake of God. The Holy Prophet said, if you had not done so, the fire of hell would have burned your face. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, our keynote speaker, Mr. Muhammad Ibrahim Iklav, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I guess uh, due to time, we just move on. Uh, we have our Right Honorable Alison Toulis, uh, who has uh, joined us. And uh, since she was actually meant to have uh, spoken before the kilo speaker, we'll permit Alison to say some few words because I know she's been very busy today, but still managed to make some time to join us. So Alison, over to you. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum. And uh, apologies for being so late to join you this evening. I was on a meeting earlier on. Um, but I want to um, thank Mr. Ibrahim Ikhalif uh, for, his, for his words because they were very thought provoking about how we can best live with one another, how we can share this, this earth that we, we are all on, um, and how best to be good neighbours to our friends. And um, I think that was very thought provoking and will certainly um, will stick with me. 
um, particularly in a world where there is so many, so many divisions and so much argument and so much um, contention between people. Uh, I think it's very important to remember that we um, have so much in common that we can we can work together on. And I suppose I wanted to reflect on, on two things really. One, two things to give us hope, I suppose, for the future, because there are there are many things that we can see make the future difficult or make the future hard. Um, but the first thing was was a thing that happened today that the um, the treaty and the prohibition of nuclear weapons uh, was was ratified today because a 50th state, um, Honduras, even a small a small country in the world, have, have made this big decision, which means that this treaty is now a treaty that is um, uh, is ratified because um, 122 countries um, agreed with the treaty at the UN, but it doesn't come into law until 50 states have ratified it. So that is a, a good and positive thing that perhaps there is. Um, something in countries coming together of all different sizes um, to work towards a common goal of removing the scourge of nuclear weapons from our world. So I think that's that's a good thing to reflect on as well. And the other thing that I wanted to mention was some some data that came out this week about the, um, the, the PISA results, which are international education results. And these ones, instead of concentrating on how well children are doing in their, in their maths or their science or their English, it was about how children treat one another within the world. And one of the really positive things that I found, um, certainly for my constituency, uh, is that students in Scotland uh, were among the top 10 countries uh, out of the, the countries that took part in this with the most positive attitudes towards immigrants. And I think that's a really interesting and good thing that our education system in Scotland, well, you might want your child to be good at maths or be good at English, being a good citizen and seeing your place in the world and looking after people who come from other countries to, to do as the honour of making Scotland their home. Uh, I think that gives me some hope for the future as well, that uh, in a world of division, we have pe young people here in Scotland who can be looking out for one another. Um, and that certainly gives me some hope for the future as well. Um, but I do think there's there's a lot to be to be said about um, championing human rights and to make sure that we do uh, look after one another in the world because uh, we all are humans, we all have rights, and we need to protect those whatever we can do with the respect and dignity to one another in our attitudes and how we conduct ourselves. And I'm very um, heartened to have to be part of this discussion tonight, and that the Amadea community in, in Glasgow and in Scotland and in the world uh, stand for those human rights uh, wherever they are. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Right Honorable Alison Toulis, the SNP uh, spokesperson for, for the Treasury, and then also our MP for Glasgow Central. Thank you very much, Alison. Thank you. But I'll move on to the uh, Q&A session. I believe there has been uh, some questions that have come through. And then uh, due to time, I just will fire on straight away. And then uh, since Ibrahim Ikhlaf has been speaking, I'll start with the, the Glasgow uh, Imam was in the person of Mr. Ibrahim, uh, Mr. Rawauddin Arif Khan. And the first question is, what principles laid down by Islam for establishing world peace? Mr. Arif Khan. So I'm, I'm just going to briefly mention because many of the points were already covered uh, in the speech of our respected guests and myself as well. Um, the worldwide head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is, um, you know, the Imam and the global head of the community and striving day in and out to establish world peace. And he mentioned, you know, every year, uh, as you know, most of our guests uh, are aware that uh, we hold peace conferences as we are, you know, today is also one of these peace conferences. And you know, one in the national or international peace conferences, His Holiness, uh, you know, would mention uh, that there are three key points to remember in order to establish world peace. First and foremost, being the loyalty to the nation, um, you know, which is one of the greatest human values. Um, the people who have excelled in this quality are, uh, of course, the prophets of God Almighty. So we should you know, look up to them and and take them as our example. The, the second point being uh, in, in, in order to establish world peace is not as elusive as people believe. However, it requires that nations practice the principles of 
absolute justice and disregard greed, whether it, you know, whether establishing absolute justice be against oneself, but in order to create peace in society, one has to do that. The third point, you know, he would mention is to be compassionate and sympathetic towards your fellow humans, be they your neighbors or nation, and, and to help those who need help without any expectations of material gains. So by following these simple and humble principles, you know, we can strive towards establishing world peace. And this is all from an Islamic point of view. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Raudin, uh, Imam Raudin Arif Khan. Uh, I hate to say this, but then unfortunately, I would have to say it that uh, let's try and keep the questions quite, uh, I mean, brief, uh, just because of time. I know I, I wish to cover as many questions as possible. And uh, the next question goes to our keynote speaker, and that is, how does your Ahmadiyya, I like the way the person, the person has put the question, how does your Ahmadiyya Muslim community feel about these extremist groups like ISIS, Taliban, Boko Haram, etc.? And how can we stop them? I think, I think because you said keep it short, I think one sentence, very simple one sentence, any religion which encourages killing others is no religion at all. Any religion which encourages to kill other people is no religion at all. Whether it is Islam or Christian or other, Islam is very clear. The Islam itself means sub submission and peace. Islam, the core point of Islam is peace. Islam categorically rejects and condemns every act of terrorism. Islam does not provide any cover or justifies any act of aggression, whether committed by an individual, a group, or government. No true religion, again, can sanction violence and bloodshed of innocent men, women, and children in the name of God. Indulgence, again, in terrorism, even in the name of whatever noble objective is completely incompatible with the teachings of Islam. As I mentioned, the summary is any religion which encourages aggression and killing people is no religion at all. Thank you. I think, Ahmed, I answered the question. <laughs> Possibly there's some kind of internet. I think someone should take it over, the missionary, <laughs> until uh, I think you should take it over. Someone should take it over or the regional uh, president. Anyone should take it over. We, you know, something that is very, you know, the, the points you mentioned are very, very important. And especially in terms of extremism, uh, the teachings of Islam are very clear that, you know, the Holy Prophet of Islam, uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that Allah will not be merciful to those who are not merciful to mankind. And he also mentioned that kindness is a mark of faith and whoever has no kindness has no faith. So extremism and all these, uh, you know, brutalities in the name of Islam you know, have nothing to do with Islam. And as, you know, as a Muslim who is a peaceful person, you have two main obligations as, you know, to, to complete your faith. One is to worship God Almighty and the other one to be of benefit and serve mankind. And, you, you know, you can't do that if you follow extremist views and uh, are, are prone to, you know, want to or desire to kill innocent lives. But of, co of course, as a Muslim, you are one uh, from, from whose hands and tongues others are safe. So I think that that sums it up. I think Emma Khadasab is back. So if you want to take it over. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I guess my internet had uh, gone off. Uh, this is part of uh, what we face with this virtual world. Uh, thank God is back. Uh, I'll go back to Ibrahim uh, for the next question. And does, does Islam actually teach hatred for people of different faiths and none? Uh, I, as I mentioned, no, absolutely not. As I said, the first chapter of the Holy Quran starts 
all praise belongs to Allah, the Lord of all mankind. That means he's the God for all mankind, irrespective, you know, their religion or their race or background or color. He's the God of Christianity, Christians, Jewish, Muslims, atheists, whoever they are. And uh, another thing which I want to mention, because in this context, sometimes the point is raised, uh, there's anti-Semitism among in Muslims that said, no, this is not true at all. Looking into history of mankind itself, or well, let's say the last 1400 years, if we look, for example, in Spain with the Inquisition, we find that the many, when the Jews were persecuted along with the Muslims in Spain, you find in 1492, you find the Jewish going to what is now called Morocco and going back, some of them went to northern part of Europe, for example, Amsterdam, Holland, etc. But many of them went to the Arab world, the Muslims, they have been protected. I will go even into depth for this for people. I myself, I'm of Moroccan origin, my parents at least, although I was not born there. And Morocco, in, uh, in 1948, three, when Israel had been established, 300,000 Moroccan Jews migrated to Israel. And can you believe or not, at the moment we have in Israel, one and a half million Moroccan Jews, which means in Morocco until now, 2020, the Jewish are complete, they are citizens like we are citizens in the United Kingdom. They are treated equally like others. And Quran says, and I think that is the most, I think to, uh, I think to, 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 to remove the whole, the whole concept, the Quran says, if I will, if I will read it from the Holy Quran, it says those in my own words, those who believe whether they are Muslims, Christians, Jews, the Sabians, followers of other religions, whether they, if they believe in God and in the last day, perform their good deeds, they have nothing to fear. Allah is compassionate and merciful. No, Islam does not teach any hate. Any kind of hate is causing disorder and is considered as a grievous sin and, and uh, an idol in the hearts and obstacle and hindrances but for the progress of mankind. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Arif. Uh, Imam Arif Khan, I'll go to you for the next question. And that is, we see the growing of extremism uh, groups by day. Is suicide bombing and extremism ever justifiable in Islam? I think uh, this was what's previously answered. So, so first and foremost, no. And the Holy Quran clearly sets out the prohibition of taking one's own life, uh, where it says that, and kill not yourselves. Surely Allah is merciful to you. And whoso does that by way of transgression and injustice, we shall cast him into fire. And that is easy with Allah. So this is from chapter 4, verse 30 to 31. It makes it clear that suicide is forbidden and is condemned by the teachings of Islam. So when suicide is used as a mechanism to murder others, then it becomes an even greater sin. So suicide bombing is, is abominable and, and a heinous act that has no justification in the teachings of Islam. Thank you very much. Uh, Ibrahim Saib, I'll come back to you for this question. And that is, what do you think about the Black Lives Matter movement? And do you support the movement? I think this is a very, I think it's one of, I think the most important things, I think we did not cover it, I think today. I think this point, our Caliph, uh, the, the, His Holiness, the fifth Caliph, uh, Mizza Masrur Ahmed, uh, may Allah be his helper, and he give his guidelines on this. And I think everyone will benefit from this. And uh, he, may, he mentioned very clear, Peace can only be built on solid foundations of honesty, integrity, and justice. Then he says to protect, and this is not only in relation, please, I want to make it clear. This is not only relation to the African Americans in America. This is also applicable to my own nation, the Arabs, the Arab Spring, or I will call it the Arab Winter, the so-called Arab Spring. You see, it has, 
It has never any element of an Arab Spring. We call it the darkness, I think, in the history of the Arabs and a dark age for the Arabs, the Arab winter. To protect, protest against any government, vandalism and rebellion are all actions that are totally, as far as Islam concerned, against the teachings of Islam. The Holy Quran does not only address the public, it also enjoins the rulers, instructing them not to create disorder in the land based on arrogance of power and authority. They should not usurp the rights of people. They should not let such a wide gap develop between the rich and the poor that leads to restlessness leading to rebellion. So by these deeds of theirs, the rulers, in reality, incur the wrath of God. Pay, he says, the caliph, attention to prayer as much as possible. Then if these politicians are not good in your view, despite that, the Holy Prophet was very clear about it. And I tell you, and I think, uh, uh, Ahmed, I just want to go in depth on this. In 2011, when this started the Arab Spring and it went to Syria, the West and the East, the Arab other countries say freedom. We should, you see, we should fight the governments. Unfortunately, America and other countries started to say, yes, we should support this for the freedom of Arabs to create peace. Libya was the same. Can you tell me now 2020, where is the peace in Libya? Libya became even the center now. We are afraid now that extremism is going to Morocco, Algeria, Mauritania, Mali, all that center of extremism. Iraq, where is Iraq? Can you tell me where is Syria? Where are these countries now? This is the reality which we should face. The Holy Prophet said, and the Caliph mentioned, no one should stand up against these leaders or to make too much of an outcry and destroy the peace of society. Rather, you pray and wait. And the reason for this, otherwise he mentioned, you will destroy the society, complete the society, millions will die. Now, what did we benefit? My wife is from Syria. Her house destroyed. Her brother was imprisoned for a year, tortured. Her family, people killed in her family, now, after eight, seven years, this, what did we benefit? Nothing. In relation to Black Lives Matters, the Caliph says very clearly about this. If you should wait, you pray, and when the next election comes, you elect those leaders who are beneficial and sincere to the country. If they do take part in the protest, then they should not take part in anything that's illegal or violence or damage to person personal property or the state property. Members should be educated that protests are of limited effect. I give you example. There have been other occasions where marches or protests have taken place. Remember the days of Martin Luther King. Did anything change? But the problem stayed and remained systematic. They should be educated that to get rights will require planning a long-term strategy, as the effects of protests are short-term and limited. The real way to affect, to change a society is to put pressure on the authorities. Every member should be mobilized to use their civic and democratic rights, rather than staying at home on the days of election. They in turn should encourage other citizens that if they want to take to affect a change, then they should take part in the democratic process at all levels. This is the way how you change and vote in people who will further their rights and causes. Meet the officials, national officials, etc. Put pressure on them. That is why he says, for generations, black people and other minorities have sought to get their rights through marches and protests, but it never changed. The Ahmadi should recognize that true success will be achieved through following the principle of teachings of Islam and not by the latest political trends, by putting your knee there and symbolically showing solidarity. That is very beautiful symbol, but it doesn't change anything. Consequently, in accordance to Islam, our campaigns and efforts should be focused on ensuring 
that African Americans and other minorities should take part fully in all the democratic processes and they should focus on being represented in all levels of government, law, enforcement and other sectors so that a real change can occur. And this is the message they have been given by the Caliph who is residing here, you see, in the United Kingdom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess uh, due to time, I'm just going to take two more questions and then uh, that will be it for tonight uh, because I believe uh, mm -hmm. time is running out on us. Uh, Imam um, Raul Dean Arif, I'll come to you for this. And I believe um, you might have said something that well, I've triggered this question. And that is, um, do the Ahmadiyya uh, Muslim followers obey the laws of the country? I'm going to combine about three questions which are quite similar to each other. So just, just bear with me there. And the other one is, uh, you, you claim that uh, we uphold uh, absolute justice, but how can we do that? How can we achieve that? So if you can uh, answer that for us, please. So firstly, yes, it is uh, mentioned in the Holy Quran that uh, uh, that you have to obey Allah and you have to obey the messenger, uh, the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and those who are in authority among you, be it uh, the the state, be it, uh, you know, whoever is on a higher rank than you, you have to show complete obedience if it doesn't. Uh, so so it, primarily, this is the injunction. And of course, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us that uh, to have love for one's country is also part of faith. So that also, uh, you know, includes uh, the, the that point that we have to uh, show complete obedience and follow the guidelines, and you've seen that throughout our uh, you know today's program and event, and also uh, you've seen the uh, mosque tour where you've seen that we have also implemented all the government guidelines. So this is part and parcel, and also part of our faith. Um, and the other question was, uh, can you repeat that again? What was it? How to establish uh, just absolute justice? Yeah, this is uh, was also mentioned by His Holiness, uh, the Caliph, the Global Caliph of the India Muslim Community. So I'm just going to briefly mention it. That uh, he said that to, in order to create absolute justice, you have to even you know go against yourself. It, it if it's not it, if it's not beneficial for you, but in order to create justice, you have to do you have to do it then in order to establish peace and justice, you have to uh, do anything and everything possible. And I think if you reflect on the uh, the speech which was presented by our respected uh, Imam, uh, by our respected Ibrahim Ikhlif Saab and also uh, what I mentioned before, this also you know includes all the, the points that highlights that in order to establish world peace and justice, uh, you know, we have to take these humble steps. Thank you very much. Uh, Ibrahim, Ikhlaf Sahib, this is the last question that I've reserved for you. And that is uh, something that comes with the practicality, something to actually uh, tell the viewers what the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is actually doing. And this picked from YouTube. And the question is, in fact, it's not a question, but I guess uh, it's something that you need to respond to. And that is, like the Ahmadiyya, uh, like other others, Ahmadiyya has also failed to provide any practical examples of justice. Just words would not do anything. So what is your response to that? Okay, okay, uh, uh, sorry, Ahmed, if you repeat just the, ex the question, just the, the exactly the, the question. It's not, it's not actually a question, but it's, yeah. it's a rhetorical statement that I want you to respond to. And that is, uh, just like the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, the, the other Muslim groups have done nothing. So what he's saying is the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has also not done anything. It's just literally lip services and they don't see any practical. Oh, okay. So can you, can you, can you prove yeah. that? I make, I make sure what, what is the Ahmadiyya Muslim community doing? The, uh, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, first of all, for the last hundred years or the last 120 years, number one, from the religious point of view, 
I say the Ahmadiyya community is the community which is established and we believe a divine community, you see, uh, to remove all the distorted teachings of Islam and the Muslims to remove them from this mis miserable state, which I say literally, and to show them the, to pave them the path towards a glorious future. And how do we do this? By explaining them that the Quran, as has been unfortunately understood, you know, it's not the way how the Holy Prophet himself has understood it. And in this case, as the promised Messiah himself said, there are at least 3000 differences between us and the, Sun the Sunnis and the Shia, which in it, those, ops those distorted teachings prevent them, unfortunately, to, uh, to progress. For example, I don't want to give examples, just one, for, uh, one beautiful example. They believe, for example, jihad, we should, we should spread the message of Islam by force. Justice, as our missionary mentioned, Arif Khan, and he said, you know, justice means if we, if they have the right to spread the message by force, then why should the non-Muslims have not the right to spread their ideology, ideology by force? Number two, if we, if those, we say, for example, that if someone uh, 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 apostates and leaves his own religion, a Muslim becomes a Christian, and they tell you he should be killed, which is wrong, then why absolute justice says that if a Muslim is not allowed to become a Christian, then why should a Christian allow his own follower to become a Muslim? This is the beautiful teaching of Islam. Number three, if we, for example, say, for example, France is wrong, beautiful example, France is completely wrong, and Saudi Arabia is wrong. How? I will explain you out just the principle of justice with our mission we mentioned. If we say, that justice says you should not force people, you know, any religious commandment should never be forced. There is no force in religion. Now, if we complain and we say the Saudis or Iranians are forcing a, a Christian woman to wear headscarves, this is wrong, of course, then we should also at the same time say that France is also not allowed to force women not to wear headscarves. That means do not force women to wear headscarf, nor force women not to wear them. This is justice. This is a religious point of view. Now, what did we do for mankind? We go to Africa, go, for example, hospitals, thousands of hospitals, university schools are built. You go to far remote villages in Africa and you find if villages are built for them, you know, clean water, pure water for them. Water pumps are built there. S education is uh, created from solar panels are built there. So much is done in Africa, millions and millions invested there. Look to the UK itself, the Ahmadiyya Muslim Youth Association, which the our missionary, Arif Khan himself, is the reg is responsible originally for Scotland for the uh, for this. Uh, we call it khidmat al or humanitarian aid, etc. When there is any flood, for example, during the flood some years ago, the Ahmadiyya Youth Association was the first one to be at the forefront. Then we have the COVID-19. Thousands, thousands of houses and people have been helped. The Ahmadiyya Muslim Youth Association went to the houses, gave them, gave them, uh, gave them food and uh, provided them everything. Anything they need are provided. Even, for example, fireworks you see in Europe in the, during the uh, New Year, you see those who clean the next day, 1st of January, clean everything with well, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Then we have the charity walk. The, every year you have the charity walk under the Elderly Association as well, uh, as well under the Ahmadiyya Muth, uh, Youth Association. Uh, the, the Ahmadiyya Muslim Youth Association raises funds and they are here helping the uh, so many of those institutes for the sake of uh, uh, relieving people from diseases like cancer, etc. The Ahmadiyya community day and night is engaged in helping the people, alleviating and alleviating people from their pain and people relieve. In reality, no one relieves people from all the problems and pain and, and poverty as the Ahmadiyya Muslim community does among all the Muslim 
Muslim groups in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess uh, this is what time would permit due to uh, obviously time itself. We now move on to the uh, the closing uh, remarks and then the uh, vote of thanks to be done by the president of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in the person of Mr. Abdul Samad Khan. Mr. Abdul Kamad Khan, uh, Khan, if you can, if you can uh, unmute him for us. Yes. Yes, you can. We can okay, hear you. Everyone. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon all our participants on Zoom, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. All too soon, such an important and interesting event in, is coming to an end. As the president of MDA Muslim Community Glasgow, I would like to express my gratitude to you all for taking time from your very busy schedule to join us today for such an important program. The MDA Muslim community is at the forefront of bringing all the community together with the aim of fostering peace among us. Coronavirus has made it very difficult for us to meet at our community center in Glasgow. But because we are determined to continue with the good work that we do, we have resorted to this virtual medium. And as such people who will otherwise not be able to join us can now join us from every part of the world. So I would like to express my gratitude to all. But as Muslim, we know that Almighty God, Allah is the only one who can give us the ability and strength to organize such events and bring you wonderful people together. So our first gratitude goes to the, to the Almighty God for making this event a very successful one. I hope all participants have enjoyed and learned a lot from tonight. Now I would like to thank our keynote speaker today, Mr. Ibrahim Akhlif Sahib, the Director for Outreach and the Muslim Community UK, then our MP Right Honorable Alison Thules, who despite a very busy schedule today with many meetings, still managed her best to join us to address the audience. That shows her passions for human rights. I also would like to thank Reverend Peter Gill, Minister Church of Scotland, and sincerely apologize to all whose names I couldn't pronounce correctly. We also had uh, Councillor Eileen McCartan, MBE, Scottish Liberal Democrat Councillor for Paisley South Ward, who had attended our event for the first time, and Mr. Ronald, Ronald Bala, General Secretary Union of Liberian Organizations in UK. We are very thankful to them. It was a great pleasure for us to have all the speakers and audience who have taken time for their important assignments today to support them for this event. May Allah God Almighty bless you all and hope to see you again in our future events. Thanks again to everyone. Thank no. you very much. Uh, our revered president of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, uh, Glasgow. Obviously, sadly, everything that has got a beginning has got an end as well. So this is what time will permit us. Remember, the motto of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is love for all, hatred for none. Keep distant with you and let us stay safe in this COVID period. Thank you very much. I'll now request our keynote speaker, Mr. Ibrahim Eklav, to lead us in a silent prayer to bring the program to a close. Mr. Ibrahim Eklav. Please join me in silent prayer.
Yes, thank you. Amen. Thank you very much. And then please keep the uh, comments and then keep engaging yourselves on Facebook, YouTube, and then obviously the Imam Muhammad, uh, Imam our Imam Rawaudin Arif Khan would definitely come and try to respond to all the comments which have not been answered here. Apologies to anyone who has not got your questions answered. Thank you very much. And definitely until we bring you another virtual event, this is where time will permit us. Thank you. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy, and the blessings of the almighty God be upon you all. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye for now. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Ahmed.